Today's webinar has been organized by AMD Global Telemedicine, the Center for Rural Health Innovation, and the Children's Partnership Organization. We have all come together today to help you understand more about school-based telemedicine, including what's involved, how to get started, and some of the secrets that have been learned from the successful school-based telemedicine programs out there. During the webinar, you will hear from two presenters, Jenny Catlove, the Director of Strategic Health Initiatives at the Children's Partnership Organization, and Amanda Martin, the Executive Director at the Center for Rural Health Innovation, which runs the My Healthy Schools Telemedicine Program. Jenny is going to share with you a brief overview of how school-based telemedicine is currently being used, as well as the benefits it serves not only to the children, but the impact it has on the community as well. And Amanda is going to speak from her experience with a successful school-based telemedicine program and give you the details of how to get started and, more importantly, how to maintain. And now, to kick off the webinar, I introduce you to Jenny Catlove from the Children's Partnership. Hi. My name is Jenny Catlove, and I am with the Children's Partnership. The Children's Partnership works to ensure that all children, especially those at, being, at risk of being left behind, have the resources and opportunities they need to grow up healthy and lead productive lives. One area we focus on is ensuring that children and families benefit from the transformation of our healthcare system through information technology. And within that context, we have worked to ensure that the benefits of telehealth extend to underserved children. And as, you, as we're, we'll talk about uh, today, telehealth is one tool to help schools meet the healthcare needs of students and families. My presentation will go over some research that we conducted a few years ago. Um, we, high, we researched and talked to nearly 18 school-based telehealth programs across the country. And from that, we gleaned lessons learned and best practices. So today, I'm going to talk to you about why telehealth is an important tool to bring health care to children in schools, how school-based telemedicine benefits children, families, schools, health care providers, and communities, how school-based telemedicine programs are financed and sustained, and lessons learned from programs across the country. Before I start, however, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page as to what telemedicine is. I know most of you know what it is, but it makes sense for all of us to be on the same page and that we're using the same definition. So basically, telemedicine is the use of technology to provide health care at a distance. And that can be either in real time or what's called store and forward, where data is collected on what, at one site and sent to a provider at another site. Um, and Amanda is going to go over that in a little more detail later on. So why do we use telehealth in schools? So first I'm going to start in, uh, by saying that schools are a great place to provide care, health care to children. Oftentimes, schools are the only place where children get health care. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Either there are no health care services in the community, or families face socioeconomic barriers to getting to health care. And so schools are really, really fill that gap in making sure kids get the health care that they need. However, lots of schools don't have the capacity to bring care to their schools. And so telehealth can, telemedicine can add value to existing school-based health services. For example, a school-based health center may have many services on site, but may need to connect to an outside provider for mental health services or an asthma specialist. Um, also, school-based telehealth allows community health systems, such as clinics and hospitals, to bring care to where children are. Clinics, for example, oftentimes have in their mission to serve the entire community. However, they can't guarantee that everyone has the resources and the ability to come to their bricks and mortar site. Therefore, they can use telehealth to reach their population where they are, such as at school. 
telehealth is really um, can be very um, time effective, and it helps keep children in school and parents at work. So instead of a child having to go out of the out of the school and even out of the community for a doctor's appointment, which could even be a whole day out of school and a whole day off of work for parents, telehealth brings that care to the school. And the parents can stay at work. We know that low-income parents are much more likely to miss pay when they miss work than their more affluent counterparts. In our research, we found that parents are really satisfied with school-based telehealth. They know their kids are getting taken care of. And as I mentioned before, it can be an effective use of resources and can be very cost effective if done correctly. So what are some of the ways that telehealth is being used to bring care to children at school? Well, one is acute and primary care. So let's say a child um, comes to school with an ear infection or even a, a rash and the child doesn't necessarily need to go home and in fact a child could be seen from a distant site using telehealth, get a diagnosis, get a treatment plan and even a prescription called into the family's local pharmacy all while staying at school. Chronic disease management. Um, there's a program in Syracuse, New York that connects children and their school nurse at school to a diabetes specialist center hundreds of miles away. They meet via telemedicine on a monthly basis to go over how the child is doing with their diabetes type 1, how their behaviors are and if the disease is under control. And this really helps the school nurse help the families as well. Um, the final example I want to give, in addition to the ones that are listed here, is dental care. There's a program in California called the Virtual Dental Home where dental hygienists and dental assistants are placed in schools and head start sites. They do exams, they collect data, including x-rays, intraoral camera exams, and they chart notes. They send those data over to a supervising dentist um, a, in the community or even in a distant site who develops a treatment plan, who develops a treatment plan for the hygienist to carry out or for the hygienist to make a referral for more complex care. Results so far of this program have found that first, the majority of these children would have gone without needed dental care had it not been for this program. And approximately 50% of the patients in this program are able to stay in their community site without having to go to a, a, a dentist at a distant site for their care. So one of the big questions is financing and sustaining school-based telemedicine, and we know you have a lot of questions about this. What we learned when we talked to these programs was that, well, not super easy. A lot of programs are able to get grants for startup. They're able to get grants for the technology. And they're also able to get grants either from local or state philanthropy or uh, federal or state funded grants. Um, and usually they're able to get funding for you know a one to three year pilot. However, once that pilot is up, if programs don't have a business plan, many of them are going to have a very difficult time sustaining themselves. And so sustainability is something that school-based telemedicine programs should be thinking about from day one. One, one um, strategy that we learned some programs were using was leveraging current technology. Many schools already have technology on site that they use for distance-based learning and coordinating administration, so maybe the school administration or superintendent's office is connecting to the local schools or um, advanced uh, placement students are using distance learning to connect to a, a uh, university. The other source of funding that may um, be a little unusual, one that we may not think about, is education funds. In Maryland, there is a school-based telemedicine program there that was able to tap into both state and local education funds because the state and local education entities saw the educational achievement benefits of 
keeping children in school and by taking care of their health. And then in this case, it was their mental health. Medicaid and CHIP. We are really thinking about our most underserved children. And so as much as possible, it's important is that we bill when we can. Amanda is going to talk a lot more about this and talk about how Medicaid billing played a role in how um, they made their decisions on what they were going to do with their program. If your state does not reimburse for uh, telehealth, it's important that you start talking to your uh, policymakers at your state capital. The other way that Medicaid and CHIP work, and this, this is for any program, is creating volume. Obviously, the more you have, the bigger bang you're going to get for your buck. And then finally, there's lots of kids out there who are eligible for Medicaid and CHIP but not yet enrolled. And so if your program can coordinate with a local outreach program, you're going to do a better job of getting kids enrolled and be able to bill for those kids. Finally, Medicaid administrative assistance dollars are dollars that education programs, schools can use to do the administrative side of health care, not direct services, um, but the coordination piece. And New Mexico is using their Medicaid administrative assistance dollars to coordinate their school-based telemedicine program. So what did we learn when we talked to folks? We learned that engaging parents is really critical. And this is very similar to the, the, uh, the bullet around obtaining community buy-in. Everybody needs to be at the table to know to, so that parents and the community members understand what telemedicine is, understand how it can really help their children, and respond to their questions and take their input in when designing the program. The role of the school nurse is crucial. We know that, for example, in California, more than half of the schools in California don't even have a school nurse. However, um, where there is a school nurse, it's critical that you include them. But, make, but um, you need to understand that the school nurse may not be able to coordinate that visit, but they be critical in building trust along the community and creating referrals. Conduct a needs assessment. We don't like to use technology just for technology's sake. And so if, if there's a service that's um, be available locally and kids are using it, it makes sense to find out why first before you bring in a program that provides that same service. So just make sure you're really filling a gap. And work with local health care providers so that there's continuity of care and promote a medical home. Amanda is going to also talk about this, where even if a service is provided by a provider that's hundreds of miles away, such as a specialist, make sure that the primary care provider of that child knows that that child saw that dermatologist or that endocrinologist that's far away so that the primary care provider can coordinate the services for the child. Take a multidisciplinary approach. This is really important. Um, in order to get things right, you need to have at the table the experts in telehealth, the education community from the teacher, school nurse, other school staff, principal, superintendent, so there's buy-in and an understanding across the board. Make sure you have both the telehealth or the provider technology experts and the school technology experts there so that, um, so that uh, the technology is coordinated. One of the things we learned is that schools control their technology and they may put up firewalls or have other barriers that the school-based telemedicine program may not know about. But if that's coordinated, then your school information technology expert can be your friend. As I mentioned with the school nurse, schools need resources. You can barely ask the school to do one additional thing. And so just make sure you're cognizant of what it really takes to bring a program into a school. And then, of course, we all know it's important to invest in evaluation so you can refine your program and build on best practices. So this research is all compiled into an issue brief that we put together a few years ago. And I uh, recommend you go to our website so that you can learn a little bit more about the programs that we reviewed. Here is my contact information, and I look forward to hearing from you as well as participating in the question and answer period. And right now I will care
turn it over to Carrie and Amanda, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Jenny. And now um, Amanda Martin is going to speak about her specific experiences with the My Healthy Schools telemedicine program, how they develop it, what they learned along the way, and um, hopefully you can learn from it for developing your own program. Amanda? Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Okay. So I'm Amanda Martin, uh, as Carrie said, and I run the My Healthy Schools telemedicine program. And I will walk you through a little bit about why we're here and how we got to the point where we are. And some very key topics uh, like billing and getting paid for what we do and then those challenges and surprises and some resources that you can use now if you're starting now that we didn't necessarily have when we got started. So there's a little bit of an overview. Uh, so our focus for this program is related to improving academic outcomes. Um, it's about making sure that students are healthy and ready to learn. Um, our founder is Dr. Steve North, who's a family doctor and adolescent medicine specialist uh, who practices here in our community, but he was a teacher first before he went to medical school. And during that time teaching in a very um, underprivileged area in eastern North Carolina, he had the experience of seeing students in his classroom who were simply not ready to learn because they were in a lot of pain or were sick. And a child with his head down on his desk because he's sick and has no access to health care is not prepared to learn. Um, so school-based health centers exist, um, but they really weren't feasible for this area. More on that in a minute. So as Jenny described, there's lots of different ways that this could work, lots of decisions to make. So we started off by looking at the existing models for school-based telemedicine. These are a few that you might want to look into. They're all a little bit different, different ways to organize this, these kinds of programs. Um, some are connecting many schools to many doctors. Some are connecting just a few schools to one doctor. There's um, the sky's the limit, lots of different ways to do this. But I would point out to you in this short list, that all of these titles include the words university, or children's hospital, or medical center. <laughs> and where we live, we don't have anything like that. So one of the other choices you need to make is the difference between store and forward and, and not store and forward. So to start with this, um, the technique for providing uh, the care, in this case, the one that we're looking at here is store and forward, which is where the um, person with the patient takes pictures, takes the HPI and the history, and packages all that up and sends it to the provider who might five minutes later, five hours later, five days later, will look at that and get back to uh, the patient with what they think is going on. Uh, this is not quite the same thing as taking a picture uh, with your iPhone and texting it to your doctor. It's more than that, but it's certainly not happening live. The alternative to this is real-time telemedicine, which is live and interactive. It's um, video conferencing, uh, it's secure, it's private, it is not Skype, it's not going to end up on YouTube, um, but it does let the provider guide the physical exam and ask questions uh, instead of assuming that the presenter on the other end knows what to ask and what to look at. In our state, it is also billable and we can get reimbursed for it. Uh, more on that in a minute, but this is an important distinction for us. Setting up this video conferencing capacity in the schools also means for us that we can do a lot of things that uh, weren't necessarily our primary objective but benefit the students in the schools, like health education, group discussions, connecting the schools to one another, not just our provider, um, because they do share school nurses. It's nice for the nurses to be able to look after their, their students at another school without getting in the car and driving. So I keep alluding to this community. Let me show you where we are. This is North Carolina, and right up there in the corner are Mitchell and Yancey counties. And these are the two communities that our program serves right now. We are on the state line with Tennessee, right in the Appalachian Mountains. There are about 17,000 people in each county, of which 2,000 in each county are school-aged kids. So altogether, we're looking to serve two school districts, 14 public schools, 4,000 school-aged kids, 
plus about 800 young adults at the local community college. That's our entire population. In a lot of communities, that wouldn't even make up one pediatric practice. And our kids are spread out all over these two counties. We're in the mountains. We have the highest peak this side of the Rockies <laughs> on this side of the country. Uh, Mount Mitchell is located in Yancey County. And the primary industries here are manufacturing, logging, farming. Uh, across all scoring systems, we're rural and we're poor. Whether it's free and reduced lunch or the health provider shortage areas, uh, you'll find us. So taking into account who we are, what it's like here, who we're trying to serve, and the models that we could find information about, we chose um, what's called a hub and spoke model. So when you think about a bicycle tire, and I've provided you a picture of a fun bicycle to imagine this with, you think about the provider being at the hub in the middle and the spokes reaching out to the schools or the spoke sites where the patients are. So the provider's at the hub, patients are at the spokes. Keep in mind, I'm not talking about literally physically in the center. This is technology. It doesn't really matter where the provider is. In our case, um, we have a nurse practitioner who provides most of our care and she works from home. She's about 30 miles from the closest school and about 60 from the farthest. Uh, and as far as the internet's concerned, it doesn't matter. So what's at those locations? Let me talk you through a little bit of this. At our spoke sites, which are at the schools again, we have what we call our telemedicine cart. We call it a cart because it's on wheels. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily have to be. But what we have there are the monitors and the webcams for the video conferencing. But we also have the extra cameras, uh, the stethoscope, otoscope, general exam camera. And at those schools, um, we need to be in a reasonably private space, although not necessarily a dedicated space. Every school is different. Some of them have more space. Some of them have less. Sometimes we can share space with um, other uh, folks who provide services less than full time at that school, such as the speech therapist or physical therapist or social worker. The person who operates that equipment, we call a presenter. They're trained to operate that equipment, take vitals, and literally present the patient to the provider at the direction of the provider. A lot of times that's the school nurse. Sometimes it's somebody else who's been trained to do it. The hub site is the provider end. And this is much more simple. At the hub end is the provider. And really, they just need um, their computer with a webcam because everything that they're seeing is coming over the internet. Um, in our case, our medical director sees patients uh, every day in his traditional clinic, but he can also open his laptop and see a patient over telemedicine wherever he and his laptop are with an internet connection. So here's a little bit more detail on those special cameras, just to make sure that we're really clear that we're talking about a lot more than just video conferencing. The, with these cameras, with the otoscope, with the electronic stethoscope, the provider and the presenter are hearing heart and lung sounds at the same time. They can say, ooh, a little to the left, or can I hear that again? Um, they can hear and see everything that they could do if they were there in person, physically together, with the exception of touch and smell. But the presenter is there to be those hands for the provider. The general exam camera is one of my favorites and is also a favorite for our other users in our community because it's the one that lets you show mm, a nice close-up view of the poison ivy on the back of your knee, <laughs> which is very hard to get in front of the webcam. Uh, it's very mobile and easy to move around. So where did we start? I can't stress enough how important it is, how critical it is to um, build those relationships locally. The champions who came forward to make this project happen in our community include the health department, school board, school staff, uh, school nurses, other clinical or other healthcare providers in the community, and our local hospital. We do have a small hospital, and having their support and encouragement has been really important. We also looked at other resources that were already out there, like the American Telemedicine Association, um, and ways to move on from where we were. I would also point out, <laughs> this is the point where I say, now who's actually going to own this program? And we found that we needed an entity to house this um, because we don't have a handy medical university in our backyard. 
Uh, so we decided to organize our own 501c3 that's based up right here in our community with community leaders and members. In addition to that, we created an advisory board of um, teachers, parents, the healthcare workforce in our community, which helped us um, make sure that we had support in the community, but also that um, we were following along what people actually wanted and that we weren't working too independently thinking we knew what our community needed. And this also, of course, helped us start get the word out with, uh, you know, Facebook. So very formally, we started conducting needs assessments and listening sessions. And we sat down with these various groups to tell them what we were thinking about doing and to find out what they thought. Uh, I highly recommend making time for this step. Um, because if you only talk to the people who are already involved, you won't know what, what's really out there and what people think. In order to get the broadest base of information, we actually used the tried and true backpack method of survey distribution. And we sent home about 4,000 paper surveys with every single child in two school districts. Um, gave just a little bit of information about the program and then asked parents what they thought. And we asked for demographic information back with that so that we could slice and dice the info based on insured, uninsured, Medicaid, to, uh, in all the different um, ways if people were employed or not employed, if they ever had trouble getting access to care. So I could go on for an hour about the results, but let me just share a few quick slides on some of the results that we got that encouraged us to keep going. So first, they could choose more than one. They could choose as many as they wanted. Um, what kind of services would you like to see provided? And overwhelmingly, uh, acute and illness care, as you can see, followed by physical exams and then some education stuff. Also notable on here for us, though, is about two-thirds of the way down where they say counseling for depression, drug abuse, family problems. That a third of the people in our community said, yeah, that was something they'd like to see happen uh, over telemedicine I thought was impressive. And then we asked the question, so would you use it or not? <laughs> and more than half said, yes, we would let our kids use it. And then here's where they said what they would need to know. Because of course, we didn't exactly send home a comprehensive description of every detail about the program. And most of them just wanted more information and wanted to be part of it. Uh, and notably, only a few, a very small handful, said that it had to be free. So. How do we make it happen? This is the juicy part, so you might want to start taking notes. We got a lot of money to buy equipment. Um, we started with a local foundation uh, here in our community that was very generous, but got the ball rolling with that first piece of money that we needed to be able to use matching funds for the Appalachian Regional Commission, and then uh, followed by a USDA Rural Utility Service grant and then two different HRSA grants related to school-based health centers. And these have um, all combined to be able to outfit 14 spoke sites, two hub sites, and then also some of the IT infrastructure that we needed in order to be secure and HIPAA compliant. Um, but I would point out that this is all equipment. There are no operational costs included in any of these grants. And of course, the program does not run itself. <laughs> we have a nurse practitioner who is employed by us, who provides most of our care as a mid-level provider, um, a program manager to pull all the strings together and manage those grants. Uh, we have a, health, a mental health provider who works just a few hours a week, but still needs to be paid. And then, of course, IT support. Uh, in our case, the program manager and the IT support are the same person, and that would also be the person who is talking to you now. So I do both of those functions. As we grow, I'd like to think they could be split out. Uh, so we, we went after a few grants to try to cover some of those initial operational funds. Um, these two organizations with uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, of North Carolina Foundation, as well as the Kate B. Reynolds Charitable Trust, were both uh, North Carolina-based, but both very generous and accommodating working with us to try this new program. Um, and as you can see right there in the red, really important, be honest with your funders if you're not hitting your targets. One of our big challenges was guessing how much we would be able to 
how much care we would be able to provide and how many users we would have, and we were way, way off to begin with. So we started our pilot. Get to the good part of the story. With those operating funds in place, uh, we started at just three schools where 700 kids had potentially access to the program, and a little over 200 of them enrolled. And what that means, this is school-based health care. Mom's not necessarily there. So they have to give permission and consent in advance. And this is a big challenge because, of course, human nature is that you don't want to mm, learn about something or look into it till you need it. Um, but it's critical for school-based health care to work that the parents give consent in advance. Uh, so with just a couple hundred enrolled at one elementary school and two middle schools, in that first year, we didn't see just tons of patients, but that was the idea. We wanted to take small steps to work out the bugs, stretch the funding out as, as well as we could, and not grow until there was demand for it. Um, with a limited number of patients in the first year, um, we, we had a hard time. Uh, it was definitely challenging to keep things moving and get the word out. However, I must say, the ones who did use it really liked it. The feedback was all very positive, and the schools appreciated having the services in place. Uh, we definitely got enough positive feedback to warrant continued expansion. So here's what we did. The second year, we added on seven more sites, and then in the third year, four more after that. So as of today, we're offering services to every child of school age in the two counties. Um, the full coverage helps a lot with referrals from social services and the emergency department because they know that if a kid shows up, for example, in the emergency department inappropriately, they can educate and say, look, of course we're going to take care of you now, but you know this sore throat could have been seen at school. Um, let's talk about billing. <laughs> because now that we've done all this expansion, uh, it's time to start thinking about whether or not we're sustainable. We are past our ramp up and we are unsustainable. At this point, we find that we can get paid by Blue Cross Blue Shield, who owns the, or runs the state health plan um, here in North Carolina, um, as well as Medicaid here in North Carolina, um, for the ENM code, uh, for the services provided, as well as a telemedicine site fee. Um, so between those two, um, we can get paid in North Carolina. We do have challenges getting credentialed. Um, because sometimes even Blue Cross Blue Shield, the person who answers the phone in the contracting office, doesn't know that they've already been supporting our program uh, from the foundation. Um, but yes, our math shows that when we are running at full capacity with a very busy mid-level provider, we will be able to sustain ourselves. And I just realized I'm talking really slow and better get moving so that I can tell you everything I want to tell you. Here are some of the challenges. I talked about enrollment already, and like uh, Jenny alluded to, school nurses, hmm, they're not always available. It's, it, <laughs> those are some very busy people, uh, so relying on them can be a challenge. Um, HIPAA and FERPA, let me give you a quick rundown on that. Um, they turn out to be essentially the same thing. They're about privacy. If you know HIPAA, then FERPA is just the education version of it, and vice versa. Um, so student grades, attendance, things like that. Uh, if you're familiar with FERPA, then HIPAA is the same thing in the medical setting. It's medical records, health history, treatments. Uh, so we have a policy that states all this clearly, but also gives room to share information appropriately for patient care. For example, the school social worker might know that a student's attendance has been sporadic and their grades are dropping, and this is really good information to share with a medical or behavioral health provider. But by the same token, that medical provider may need to send a note with the child back to the classroom that says, it's allergies, it's not pink eye, he doesn't need to go home. So we have to be upfront and think these things through in advance, and that's worked out pretty well for us. Um, a few surprises. Um, we found that uh, offering care at school is great, unless the kids have no way to go home and buy that antibiotic or saline wash or eye drops. And so we've had to find funding to pay for those things to really make a comprehensive difference. Eavesdropping pays off is sort of a funny one. And I'll tell you, it just comes from listening to what's happening in your community. I happened to be at a football game, <laughs> sitting behind some moms who were talking about our program. They didn't know who I was. And I heard them making comments about it, and I realized how much they didn't know. And that helped shape 
um, the frequently asked questions, the marketing, that sort of thing that we do in our community. And really, we're a very small organization, and that has been terrific for letting us move where we needed to move and be where we needed to be. Um, and finally, the growth curve question. We had no idea. <laughs> uh, we're learning as we go um, about how fast we can get the word out and increase use of our services. Um, as far as things you can measure, these are all things that we are either measuring or would like to measure or hope to measure one day, but certainly that we can recommend that you pay attention to. And remember that our primary goal is to impact academic outcomes. So that's why attendance is at the top of the list. We'd also like to impact graduation rates um, and maybe the age at which people start families. And of course, we couldn't have done this alone. Here are a few uh, resources I encourage you to investigate. Uh, a lot of them have free tools that you can use as you're planning and developing a program for your own community. Uh, for example, through the Mid-Atlantic Telehealth Resource Center, my organization provides consulting services for other people trying to do similar work as us. And that is what I have. I would love to talk to you if you want to send me an email um, and hear about the programs you're developing and see what I can do to help. Thank you very much, Amanda. And now, um, quickly, we just if you want more information on telemedicine products and technology or have questions about how to set up your program design, um, AMD Global Telemedicine has clinical telemedicine systems, medical devices, counter management software, and telemedicine program design. Now for the question and answer session. We did receive quite a few uh, questions throughout um, the webinar and, and some in advance. So we'll try to go through them as many as we can. However, um, if we don't get through all of them, we will be sending out a summary email with all the questions and answers uh, within a week's time after this webinar. Mm -hmm. And Amanda and Jenny will address each one then. Um, if you have a question you haven't already entered it, the control panel on the right-hand side is a box that says questions. You can enter your questions in there. And then afterwards as well, Jenny and Amanda have said that you can certainly email them directly if you have individual questions. Um, the first question I will, this could be actually either Jenny or Amanda to answer. Um, somebody would like to hear if this can be done internationally or if you have any information on how that can be done. Um, this is Jenny. Uh, because of the technology, this can be done, uh, definitely can be done internationally. And my understanding, and Amanda, maybe you could um, uh, fill this in, is that the American Telemedicine Association has a special interest group focused on international telemedicine. So I would, I'll, I would reach out to the American Telemedicine Association around that. I would just say ditto on that. I, I don't have a lot of experience with it, but I know that ATA does. Okay, and the next question um, is, is there any federal legislation currently being considered to allow physicians to be reimbursed for school telehealth across the country? This is Jenny. Um, I think that it depends on the population. On the Medicare side, Medicare is a federal payment system, and there is reimbursement policies under Medicare. If we're ta it depends on who's paying and in which state. So each, if you're talking about the state's Medicaid or CHIP program, specifically Medicaid, reimbursement policies for telemedicine are decided by the state itself. So you need to speak with your state Medicaid office. Insurance companies are also make the decisions themselves, though if they are an insurance company that contracts with Medicaid, uh, the Medicaid program probably dictates what the insurance company needs to pay for. So um, Medicaid reimbursement policies are decided on a state-by-state -state basis. Though I know that there are, you know, very, very instant uh, conversations at the federal level about how we can um, we can make that happen nationally, but I, I do think it, you should be looking to your state Medicaid office. 
Thank you, Jenny. Um, another question here is I, I'm particularly interested in learning how to bill. Is there anything you can help me with on that? I would be happy to address that one. Um, in, in North Carolina, because of course this is going to be different everywhere, um, we use a modifier and uh, to indicate the services that have been provided by telemedicine. If, you're if you already know about billing, you know about modifiers. Um, and that modifier, I believe, is GT. Uh, and then there is the separate code for um, the site fee, which we just bill in addition to the E&M code. If you'd like to email me, I'd be happy to email you back with those specifics or we can include them in the um, uh, question and answer so that you have those written down. Great. Um, let's see, another question here. A school is not considered an appropriate originating site by CMS. Could that be changed so both students and community members could receive care at the school system? Um, this is Jenny and, you know, Amanda, maybe you should chime in as well. It's, it's, I'm, I'm not sure they're, um, by whom they're not considered an originating site if it's, um, if you're talking about your, um, oh, the telehealth connection, the telehealth um, line, the internet broadband telehealth line. Um, that sounds like what you might be talking about, and um, and I think you need to work with your state uh, center for whoever's implementing that broadband line. Um, if we're not answering your question, um, maybe you could clarify by whom you're talking about is not making is not designating schools as an originating site. Great. Um, for Jenny, this is a question for you. Do you know of any current college-based telemedicine programs specifically for behavioral health? If you're talking about um, a program that provides care on a college campus, unfortunately, I don't. Um, sorry, but if you're talk, um, but you can always reach out to me, and I can brainstorm with you how to find out that information. Um, Amanda, I think this is something you might have touched on, but I'm not sure if you answered this in your presentation. Is the store and forward reimbursable? Um, in our research, it was not reimbursable for the kind of care we wanted to provide in North Carolina, uh, which is why we absolutely went with the real-time telemedicine as an option. I'm sure that there are some cases where it is, but here uh, we had to do real-time in order to get paid. Um, you need to, one of the ways to find out if your state reimburses for either real-time or storm forward telemedicine is to go to the Center for Connected Health Policy. They are a statewide and national organization based in California and recently did a 50-state survey that outlines every state's reimbursement policy and they have a searchable database. And we can provide that, the connection to that or the link to that in the follow-up email. Great. Um, Amanda, how do your providers maintain HIPAA compliance if they're using personal computers? How do they maintain HIPAA compliance if they're using what? Um, the question was, how do your providers maintain HIPAA compliance if they're using personal computers? If they're using personal computers, hmm. Well, um, it, it's a computer that's dedicated for their professional work, so they're password protected and that sort of thing. And the the connection to um, Let's see how to say this. The video conferencing for us um, is happening over a secure network. So even if they're logging in from, say, a clinic or from the hospital uh, or their home, they're connecting into a secure environment uh, that is you know, password protected and HIPAA compliant. It's not um, FaceTime or Skype or one of those um, programs out there that could be easily hacked. I hope that answers the question. Um, some of it has to do with, you know, our policy related to not handing your laptop to your children to play games on. <laughs> um, 
but then the rest of it is actually more um, on the IT backbone that we run our program on. Great, thank you. Um, and Amanda, another question for you about your program is, do you have a nurse practitioner at each school, or does the nurse practitioner rotate between schools? Mm, that's a great question. In fact, uh, we have a nurse practitioner who almost never goes to the schools. Our nurse practitioner who provides our care is uh, providing 100% of that care over telemedicine, so she never drives from school to school. On the school end is the school nurse, who is an RN, and that's who presents the child, but the actual clinical decision making is made by our nurse practitioner, who stays in front of her computer at the hub, but can connect to any of the spoke sites as needed. Um, you know, in a matter of a few clicks, she can move from one school to another um, using the technology. Great, and uh, kind of as a follow-up to that, um, how often do you have the teleclinics at school, and how many visits does the provider see per day? The uh, telemedicine equipment is stationary at those schools. So we have 14 complete setups that stay at those schools all the time. And our provider is standing by about 32 hours a week, so essentially all school hours. Um, she is not as busy as we would like for her to be. Um, so it, at this point, a busy day for her is seeing maybe six patients in a day, um, but she is not always that busy. She could easily see more um, because the telemedicine visit does not take any longer than a regular family doctor or pediatric visit. You know, 15 minutes is pretty much enough. To, to handle the kinds of things we're seeing. Okay, and what do you do if the child has his or her own primary care provider? That is a great question, and I apologize for not including it. Um, we absolutely, like any other uh, urgent care or even the emergency department, we send a note immediately after the evaluation, after the appointment, to that child's identified primary care doctor the same way that if you went to see a specialist, they should send a note back to whoever referred you to your primary care doctor for your chart. And this is particularly useful if we see a child on Friday and prescribe an antibiotic, and on Monday they have an upset stomach, or maybe the rash isn't better, if they're going to go to their other primary doctor, um, they certainly need notes from us saying what's happened and what, we've, what we saw and what we've prescribed. And do you also see family members for care or just the students? For our program right now, we only see people who otherwise have permission to be at school um, because we can't ask the school to open their doors to anyone in the community. Um, the way that school security is these days, that's impossible for us right now. Um, so if someone already has permission to be at school, such as a teacher or the lady who works in the cafeteria, then we will see them and provide care to them. Uh, but we do not see siblings or parents or uh, grandpa from down the road yet. <laughs> and do you use an EMR system, and what do you use? And what code do you use to build the telemedicine side portion of the business? Um, yes, of course, we have to use an electronic health record, because where would we keep the paper charts? Um, so, so absolutely, we do. And we're using the one that was offered to us for free. I'm not sure I would choose it again, but that's probably always the case with EMRs. And um, the site code is, I'm not going to tell it wrong. I'll have to write it down and send it out. I'm sorry. I'd hate to say it wrong. Okay. And, and Jenny, this is, I think, a question for you. For the mental health services you talked about being used in school-based telemedicine, is this for counseling and or assessment type of activities? I, different programs are using telehealth for different mental health purposes. In Kansas, my understanding is that there is assessment and some regular services. In um, Prince George's County, Maryland, there are the um, University of Maryland is implementing um, comprehensive behavior health programs in at the time, it was about six schools, and they have on-site uh, 
social workers and other types of providers, and they use telehealth to connect to a psychiatrist on a weekly or monthly basis to do an assessment, and if the child doesn't cannot be referred to a local psychiatrist, that psychiatrist will be prescribing and other services. The goal is to connect to a local, but if there's not one available, the psychiatrist will continue on after the assessment. So you can use your imagination in how it's being used. Great, Amanda, um, this is another question I think for you about your program. How did you make your decision to use a trained presenter or school nurse as the presenter versus having a staff member like an RN or LVN to be the presenter? Well, it primarily is a financial decision. Um, some of the schools that we're serving have less than 100 kids um, in K through 5. And so for us to have a staff of 14 RNs would make the cost of our program outrageous. Um, there was no way to justify that. So we've had to um, train presenters as we could find them. I would love to have a full-time staff person at each school, but it's just not feasible. Um, this is Nancy Kazak. I don't know if you can hear me. I just joined about three minutes ago. Um, could I ask a couple questions? Sure, go ahead. I, I, I'm from Chicago here, and I've been working on some school telehealth issues, uh, both with the Chicago Public Schools and with the state of Illinois, uh, Superintendent of Education. And so we're sort of thinking through a lot of these things, and we just love to learn from people who've done this before. And here's one of the key questions we have is there's recommendations that we start our school telehealth program in high schools because the students are more mature and there's less hesitancy about the doctor engaging uh, with, with the student uh, and would less, take less involvement by a guardian or, or parent, although we would always have a medically licensed person with the student. Other arguments are that we should start with the elementary school, that it makes a lot of sense to get the parents involved and then the parents having access to the school with their child can also take advantage of those services and that then boosts up the number of consult, uh, consultations a day because we're looking at trying to uh, do 15 to 20 consultations a day. So that's my very, very long question and I just would be interested in whatever thoughts you have on guidance as to high school versus elementary school. Well, this is Amanda. I can certainly reflect a little bit on how that decision was made uh, in our community. And while there are valid points on both, for us it was a matter of learning to access health care is important um, for kids as they grow up, starting even very early, um, to understand about accessing um, appropriate levels of health care. Um, because you'd be amazed how many seven-year-olds think that every time they cough more than twice, they need to go to the emergency room. So we have a role in teaching them how to get appropriate levels of care even when they're young. The other reason that we decided to go into every school in our two counties, in our two school districts, is because of the survey data that we got back when we sent home that um, backpack survey to all of the families. Part of what we were slicing and dicing was how old are your children and what grades are they in? And we were amazed uh, that actually more parents of young children in the elementary ages said that they would be interested in using the telemedicine services. And this I thought was interesting because um, maybe, we're speculating here, maybe because those kids get sick more often, or more likely to miss school, um, but even with the possibility that the parent wouldn't be physically on site with them for the consultation, um, they still felt like it would be useful to them. Um, if the alternative is, hey, come pick your kid up, then, hey, come pick your kid up, but we're going to let them see the doctor first, sounds even better. Great. And what percentage of your students are Medicaid students? Um, we're about 40% Medicaid in our community. And have you found a substantial difference in terms of reimbursement between Medicaid and private payer? No. So they're both reimbursing reasonably? I mean, a reasonable <laughs> amount and reasonably reliably? <laughs> um, we have contracts in place with a couple of private payers, and they're reimbursing just a little bit more than Medicaid. 
Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, to not really issue an opinion on should it be more or not, that's a whole other conversation, um, but they're reasonably close to one another, what Medicaid pays and what the private payers do. And what are you finding in terms of getting access to parental permissions? Uh, one of the things that... Uh, it's an ongoing challenge. Up. I'm sorry? It's an ongoing challenge. Okay. Um, you know, one of the thoughts we had is if an SQHC is already providing services at the school, adding a telehealth component makes a lot of sense because they've already worked out the deal with Medicaid and they will be getting, have, they will have already gotten the, the parental permissions. Have, have you done any partnering with SQHCs? No, we haven't. And oh, my last question, and I'll stop rambling on here. Um, one of the solutions that they have at the Chicago Public Schools that we were talking about is the potential of having a school clinic with two sets of doors. One door that would go to the school and then another door that would be used for off hours for per, uh, parents and community members to have access to the clinic. Have you had an experience with uh, sort of having a dual purpose location? Actually, I've certainly heard of it, and I, I imagine Janine could even speak to if such uh, other models exist uh, like that. That's not feasible for our program since we are relying on school staff to present our patients. Um, access to the schools in the evening is not, is, or you know, in off hours isn't reasonable for us. But it certainly is a good idea, and it's one that I've heard about. Great. Yeah, there are some programs that, it, again, it, it really depends on the community, and there are some programs that um, have or uh, maybe currently still are using the program in the evening. It really just depends on the school site and the um, and sort of parameters around how that school is used. Okay, and we still have actually quite a few questions. Um, Jenny and Amanda, I know we've been on longer than the 10 or 15 minutes, but if you'd like to go through more of them, we do have quite a few more people still on, so uh, people are interested in hearing more. Yes, uh, go right ahead. Great. All right, sure. I have a question. Um, how do you prescribe medication? Well, uh, this is Amanda. I'll be happy to answer that one. We use the ePrescribe tool that's built into our electronic health record. Um, and when a child is enrolled, in addition to information about their health history, allergies, insurance information, primary care doctor, we ask about their preferred pharmacy. So that if uh, it's appropriate to send a prescription, we uh, e-prescribe directly to wherever they've specified. That said, um, there are some medications that have to have a paper prescription. Um, that can't be prescribed, and in those cases, we work it out. Uh, and you know, going back to that program coordinator, what that basically means is I go pick it up from the provider wherever he or she is and deliver it either to the pharmacy or to the child at school. Great. Um, it's a great question. What do you do if there is no school nurse who operates the equipment with staff changeover? How are new employees trained? And what is the how is the equipment maintained and who pays? So it's kind of a loaded, loaded question about the equipment and the um, the users of it. That is a big question. Um, I would I would start from the from the back end of that one and say that the equipment is owned by my organization, that independent 501c3. We uh, insure it and we pay for a support contract from the company that we bought it through. Uh, so that if we have a problem, we have an 800 number to call. Uh, and that's been very helpful. And when they need to, they, um, they log in or they drive over here and out to the mountains and they come help us when we need them. Um, so some of the troubleshooting can be done just by me. And sometimes we need to call in the big guns and we do that. Um, as far as when there's not a school nurse available, unfortunately in our case, that often means that the care doesn't happen. Um, but we're working on making sure that there's a backup in each school who might be, for example, a secretary who is also a, a CNA, a nursing assistant, um, or a first responder who also happens to be the math teacher, or an EMT who drives a bus. There may be somebody who's already got some basic um, you know, ability to take vitals and do some triage, 
that we can train to have on hand as a backup uh, for that presenter. Staff turnover and training, we've developed a tiny little um, cheat sheet on here's how this works. Because people, you know, anything you do that you don't do often, you sort of have to relearn every time you look at it. So if it's been a month since you've presented a kid, you might need a little cheat sheet. So we make sure that that's available right there on top of the cart, hard to miss. Um, and then we're available to help talk people through it. And our provider is excellent at talking the presenter through what she needs to happen. It's not that hard. If you can basically shop online, you can operate all of this stuff. Okay, great. Um, this is actually a question probably for both of you to comment on. Do you see local telemedicine programs happening within a vacuum, or are they sometimes a part of a more community-based technology development strategy? I think that's a very interesting question. This is still Amanda. I'll, I'll go ahead and take a crack at it first, and we'll see what Jenny thinks. Um, in our community, all of our schools had actually been connected to um, high-speed internet a few years ago through a federal grant. So they were certainly um, pursuing ways to increase technology use in the schools and, and in the community. Um, in addition, both of our high schools have recently started a one-to-one -one, uh, laptop initiative through some federal grants, which have been, and state grants, <laughs> which have really, you know, put technology into the hands of the children and changed the way that everything happens uh, through our school systems to try to keep them competitive in, in other ways and moving along with the rest of the world. Um, as far as the rest of the community, I don't know. All of our doctors are using electronic health records now, even the dentists and um, home health and the uh, um, hospice and all these different agencies are increasingly using technology to do what they do and do it better and serve more people efficiently. So I would not say that we're the only ones trying to find ways to serve more people using technology. We just happen to be the only ones doing exactly this in our community. Great. Um, okay, this is a billing question. Do you bill families for the balance of what the insurer doesn't pay for the telemedicine visit? Yes, we do the same way if they went to see a regular doctor in a regular clinic. Okay, and what, um, another question I think for you, Amanda, what has been the response from the local health care providers that you deal with? Uh, initially, uh, skepticism, right? Um, not so much that people were afraid of losing their patients because they're all overwhelmed anyway, um, barely have time to take care of the patient load they've got but rather, um, you know, how good could this care really be? But what's been nice is over the two and a half years now that we've been in operation, uh, those same providers who were skeptical at first have come around and are across the board supportive of what we're doing. They've received comprehensive notes, images, um, you know, it's a collaborative care that we're providing, uh, not trying to steal their patients or, or undermine their efforts with their patients. Right. Here's actually another question regarding the college-based um, school telemedicine. Someone um, had a question about that you mentioned that your program is extended to the local community college. Can you talk a little more about the youth within that population? Since the students don't require parent permission, have you found that the telemedicine services are more easily provided there? Uh, <laughs> certainly from the perspective of being able to sign for yourself, it's much easier. Um, our community college population tends to be um, people who are retooling to go into a new career. So they're not necessarily 19-year-olds. A lot of them are in their 20s and even 30s. I'm finding that a mill has shut down and they need to learn to do something else. So here they are. Um, a lot of these people are uninsured. So we have a sliding fee scale that helps make it more reasonable to seek care. But we have a lot of education to do to get the word out to our whole community college population about exactly what we do have to offer and why they should seek care here instead of going to the ER and running up a tab they'll never be able to pay. Uh, so is it different? Yes, it's easier because they can sign for themselves and they're not as um, controlled in their movements throughout the day. If they've got a two-hour break between classes, it's up to them what they do with that. And of course, in the uh, secondary schools or primary schools, it's not like that. Um, but then they have challenges of needing to be able to pay for the care that they receive, however nominal it might be. And we can make it nominal by 
some of the grants we have to provide that care. Some questions about uh, the nurse practitioners. Is your nurse practitioner an employee or a contractor, and how are they paid? Uh, currently, our nurse practitioner is an employee, and we pay her by the hour because at this point she is not as busy as, as we would like, so it would not be reasonable to pay her based on production. I would like to think that in the future she'll be paid on production um, based on a you know locally um, comparable percentage of what she bills, what she generates. Uh, we're just not at that point yet. So we're, we're paying her to stand by until we build capacity or as we build capacity. Okay, and what about the billing? Do you do that internally or do you contract it out and why? Um, right now we're doing the billing internally. Fortunately, it is not on my plate to do, but I have someone who works very small part-time to do just that. And the reason we're doing it internally is because of the minimums um, to hire it out are more than what we would use. We're still very small and our, um, our volume just does not warrant sending it out. Okay, um, there's only a couple more questions here. Oh, thank you for coming. Um, what do you think the ratio is for nurse practitioners to total clients should be? What do you think it should be? Ooh, that's an interesting question. Hmm. Understanding that we are um, in addition to the primary care physician, in addition to the patient-centered medical home. We're not, we're not providing all the care that someone would ever need. I think that our nurse practitioner could reasonably look after uh, six or 8,000 school-aged kids um, for the amount of care that they would need while they're at school. Um, and this is assuming that they do have primary care physicians for weekends and nights and summertime. Um, how is the EPSDT and other physical examinations conducted? That's a great question. Um, that being the uh, physical exam for Medicaid, and we have done those, um, carefully collaborating with the school nurses who perform, for example, the vision screenings and hearing screenings with the tools that they already have in the schools. Um, and in most of those cases, for the ones we've we have done. The parent was on site with the child because so much of that is history and education. Um, the parent really needs to be present. Uh, and in some cases we've had an interpreter in place as well to meet those needs. Great. I think um, I think that pretty much covers this. A few questions we might have not got to and we'll definitely compile all of those um, and send them in a follow-up email to everybody. Uh, thank you, and Amanda, for and Amanda and Jenny for answering all those questions. And thank you to the rest of you for attending today's webinar. The archive presentation will be available on our website starting on Thursday. The Q&A summary will be sent to all the attendees within a week. Like I said, we'll try to address every question that we received um, through the webinar. And we'll also be providing with a list of telemedicine resource centers that you can reference for, for the future. Thank you for attending. Have a good day.